It's good to see everyone back this evening. I hope you had a good afternoon. There in the scripture reading where Brother Chuck read just a moment ago, Paul is telling what had happened after he had become a Christian. And frankly, he's, he's talking about a conversation that he had with the Lord. There in Acts chapter 22 is effectively what he's doing, talking about that conversation he had with the Lord. And in passing, or I shouldn't even say in passing, but within that conversation as he's talking to the Lord, and he, he references Stephen there in chapter 22 at verse 20. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And then he said to me, depart from here, for I will send you from here to the Gentiles. And then we see the reaction to that lesson. And the reaction to that lesson is somewhat similar to the reaction that Stephen got after his lesson. Uh, for very different reasons, but here, as it says, they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. And it's just interesting. Um, as he mentions Stephen, as I said, with Stephen's sermon, it was something else that set them off. Here, it's going to the Gentiles. But as mentioned this morning, tonight we're going to be looking at Stephen's address, specifically in Acts chapter 7. And if you could be turning over there, and I usually, I don't like to do this very often, but I'd like to just read the whole thing, just so you can see the flow of the thought process and the flow of what Stephen says. So come to Acts chapter 7, and I'd like to just read the chapter. In Acts 7, at verse 1, it says, And the high priest said, Are these things so? Verse 2, He said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran, said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran, and from there when his father was dead, he moved, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, even though not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give, to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage I will judge, said God. And after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But, he, but when he was set out, um, when he, pardon me, but when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren and the children of Israel. Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. The next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? 
Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then, at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when forty years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out, and after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the, tabern the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern which he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What, what house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you have now become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he, when he had said this, he fell asleep. Thank you for bearing with the word of exhortation in that lengthier reading. Like I said, I wanted to read that just so you could see the flow of it a little bit. And it's, it's interesting, and I wanted to just make a few points about, about Stephen's address. To go ahead and get into those points, I'm hoping that you saw the pattern. And it's not a good pattern. <laughs> it is a pattern of rejection. And I would suggest it's somewhat, perhaps I should have said a pattern of choices and not always good choices as it is. Starts with Abraham. So to back up, in that account, 
Look back in verse 3. He said to him, being Abraham, get out, of, get out of your country and from your relatives. We know from other accounts what Abraham's family was doing. They were practicing idolatry. When God says to Abraham, get out, one of the parties is get out from your relatives. So you have that contrast between Abraham and his brethren. Okay. Then you have Joseph down in verse 9. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. I, I've always, uh, in times past, I thought, well, Stephen's just, he's just giving them a history lesson. And he's kind of buttering them up. And they're all sitting there and they're just amening the whole lesson right up until the very end. And I don't think that's the case. If, you're, if you are a faithful Jew at that time, how much stock do you put in the patriarchs, the 12? <laughs> right? We're talking about Jacob's sons, those patriarchs in verse 9. We're talking about all of the, tri the tribes would bear the names of the patriarchs. So if you're a, if you're a Jew living at that time, you're going to put a lot of stock in the patriarchs. The problem is, the patriarchs, how did they treat their brother? Are you sure you want to put a lot of stock in the patriarchs? Because they, becoming envious, sold Joseph. God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph in Egypt. And God, we know what, we know what Joseph says at the end of Genesis. They meant it for evil. God meant it to save many people alive. But nonetheless, God, Je, Joseph is in Egypt, and Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams. And through those years of plenty and then the years of famine, it is Egypt that is providing sustenance for everybody else. Jacob and all the patriarchs back in the promised land, they've got to go to Egypt. This is God's way of getting them down to Egypt. And you might remember the first time God says that's going to happen. It's when Abraham says, what sign is there? And God says, this is what's going to happen to your descendants. And you have that darkness falling on Abraham at that point, And you can read that account. But you have this pattern. You have Abraham, you have Joseph, and then, and then of course, you have Moses. And to look over at verse 25. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood. And you know what that was? <laughs> that was a bad supposition. <laughs> he supposed that they would understand, and they did not understand. Verse 39, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. And that may be speaking more about the Lord himself to go through and look at the pronouns in verse 38. But th this is the idea that they rejected Moses repeatedly. So as they all, as they thought, as they thought highly of Abraham, they thought highly of the patriarchs, and they thought real highly of Moses. And yet their fathers, right? Their forefathers, how had they treated Moses? It's a pattern. It is a pattern of, of rejection. And as Stephen is going through this, this lesson, it is a history lesson, but it's not a pleasant history lesson. It is, that, it is that lesson of rejection repeated, and then he gets to the end and he says, and you're doing the same thing. To look at what he says there at the end, verse 52, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Let's just pause there for a second. Which of the prophets, how long is that list? <laughs> It's longer than this lesson, okay? And any of them who had studied their history, he's confronting them with this truth. But then he goes on and he brings them up to the present, and they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you have now become the betrayers and murderers. He says, you're, doing the, you're making the same choice again. It's, it's that pattern. It's the pattern of rejection. It is real tempting to look back at history 
whether it's the history of a nation, whether it's the history of the church, whether it's the history of Judaism, it's real tempting to look back at history and to talk about the good old days. You know how good the good old days usually were? <laughs> you don't think there were problems back in the good old days? You don't realize that the things that happened back then are how we got to the point we are today. Some of the things that we face today, those seeds may have been planted decades ago in the good old days. How proud were the Jews of their history? Oh, they're proud. They're, they're real proud. And they, they're looking back through rose-tinted glasses. And what does Stephen do? He rips off those rose-tinted glasses. And he says, this is the history. And it's not pretty. <laughs> It's really not pretty. It's, a, it's this pattern of bad choices, and Stephen just confronts them with the truth, going all the way back to, to the beginning. I would suggest there is also a destination. I want you to look back in chapter 6. Remember the accusation. One of the accusations that was made against him that got him in this situation concerning Stephen but back in chapter 6 at verse 13, they also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Now, these were false witnesses. We'll put it this way. There are different ways to lie. One way of lying is you just completely invent some fabrication, all right? That's one way of lying. But another way of lying is you take the truth and you, t you twist it, right? That's another way of lying. It's not, it's not all brand new, but it's, it's twisted. And I wonder if it's not the case because their accusation against him and these false witnesses, it's about the temple and it's about the law. Now, did Jesus have things to say about the temple? Oh, yeah. Did Jesus say what was going to happen to the temple? Uh, yeah. Did Jesus talk about the law? Right? You have heard, but I say, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Would it be, would it be out of bounds to say, perhaps, just perhaps, had Stephen also been talking about the temple and the law and such things as that, and were they twisting his words, perhaps? You might, you might think about it, because especially concerning the temple, I think there's a destination. There, there is a place that Stephen is going, and assuredly the Sanhedrin really did not, did not like it. The Jews loved their temple. Even the disciples... Even the disciples, when they're coming out of the temple, and this is towards the end, this is almost to the point of Jesus going to the cross, and they turn around to Jesus and they start admiring the stonework of the temple. The Jews loved the temple. And that's the point where Jesus says, you see these stones? There's not going to be one stone left on another. This is what's going to happen in T-minus about 37 years. The temple's going to be destroyed. And he tells them flat out that's what was going to happen. The Jews, they loved their temple. But when you look at the end of Stephen's address, there in verse, 40, verse 47, and he references David wanted to build the temple, but God says, no, that's not how this is going to work. It's going to be your son. So Solomon builds the temple. The temple that they currently admired so much, was it even as glorious as the old temple, as Solomon's temple? It wasn't in the same ballpark as Solomon's temple, but they still loved it. But even the temple that Solomon built, you have the idea of verse 48. The Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. He just doesn't. He just doesn't. The idea of, oh, I'm going to build, I'm going to build a house for God. You know, God was perfectly fine in the Old Testament when it talks about it. And God says, did I say anything about this the whole time that you had the tabernacle? 
the tent of meeting. God was fine with that arrangement. But they built the temple. Solomon built the temple. God directed him to and gave basically the blueprints, revealed such things as that. But the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. But before that, he mentions verse 42 through verse 43. And just notice how verse 43 ends. And I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Mm. You think they were real proud of that part of their history? Now, what was it that happened as they were carried away off to Babylon? The temple's destroyed. So what, what direction do you think Stephen is headed with his sermon when he starts talking about, you know, the Most High doesn't dwell in this place. And as they rejected the Lord back then, and because they rejected the Lord, God delivered them into Babylon, and the temple was destroyed, and you're doing the same thing, what do you think God is going to do again? You understand why they didn't want to hear that? <laughs> This is, the, this is the destination, or at least the direction that Stephen is headed. He's warning them. He says, God does not dwell here. God does not dwell here, and we know what happens. And as, as the Christians were dispersed, I'm sure that would, as you think about being dispersed from Jerusalem, and we are speaking at this point, the Gentiles have not been added to the kingdom yet. So all of these that we are speaking about are Jewish converts. You don't think they still held the temple in admiration? Probably so. I would think surely so. And Stephen says, the, Lord, the Lord's not here. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now is that, at that moment... If you truly understand that and you truly believe that, is that going to give you the freedom to flee Jerusalem when the persecution starts? God's not in there. It's okay to let it go. It's okay to let it go, right? This is a new covenant. As we think about the Messiah, it's built on better promises. It's built on better blood and all those things spoken about in Hebrews. But this is the direction that Stephen is, is going. Stephen's audience that he's addressing, they thought that they were different. They thought that they were so much better than those who had come before them. And Jesus actually speaks to this in another place. In Matthew, come back to the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew 23, Jesus makes this accusation against them, and it's justified. In Matthew chapter 23... They thought they were, as Stephen confronts them with their own history, they thought, they thought they had learned from their history, but they simply had not. Matthew 23, at verse 29, says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous, and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Right? They thought they were so much better. They thought they were so different. And the Lord calls it as it is. Verse 31. Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves, that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. And that's where Stephen's going in his sermon. <laughs> that's, that's also the destination. But they, they just thought that they were so much better. They thought, if we had lived back then, we wouldn't have done it. And the Lord says, fill up the measure of your father's guilt. Not only would you have done it, again, you're actually doing something much worse. Within the parables, and I believe it's the parable of the vine dressers, where you have the master sending servants, right? And some they stone, some they kill, and they, they otherwise abuse them. And then, they, and then the master sends his son, and he says, surely they'll respect my son. And what do they say? We'll kill him and seize the inheritance. This is actually worse. They thought they were better. They weren't any better. They're repeating the pattern. And actually, actually they, were, they were worse themselves. 
I've said that to say this. We should probably be real careful about thinking if we were back, if we lived back then 2,000 years ago, we should probably be real careful about saying we would have been different. We, we should be real careful in, about thinking that way and thinking, no, we wouldn't have done what everybody else was doing. Really? <laughs> we think we're so much better. You know, they saw the miracles. They actually saw the miracles. You ever see a miracle? They did, and they still did it. We who have not seen the signs, who are we to say, oh, well, if we had lived back then, we would be different? Even Peter, because Peter effectively says the same thing. Even if everybody else denies you, I'll never deny you. Now, how many hours did it take for that to be proven wrong? Not long. It was a matter of hours. Peter says, I'm better than everybody else. And you know what he found out? No, you're not. <laughs> no, no, you're, no, you're not. We should be careful about thinking that we are that we are so much better and that we're different. Certainly, we know what Jesus says. Unless our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, we will in no way enter the kingdom. And we understand that. But the bottom line is that we still sin. We still sin. We still are the cause of Jesus going to the cross. We are just as guilty when we sin as they were. We're just as guilty. So to think that we are, we are better, we need to understand, no, nope, that we still rely on God's grace and mercy. And I would suggest as we think about, as we think about Acts 7 and Stephen's address, can we still be stiff-necked from time to time? Right? We can still be stiff-necked. And that's why we have to be willing to listen to God's word. But we can still be stiff-necked occasionally, and, and we have to be called out on it. The moment we think we're so much better, no. Nah. The Jews, they thought they were so much better than, their, than those who had come before them, and they were just, just wrong. I think it's interesting what really set them off, though, at the end of the address. Verse 54, when they heard these things, this is after Stephen says, notice what Stephen, by the way, does not say. Stephen does not say, please come while we stand and sing. <laughs> he ends it with, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit says, talks about having received the law by the direction of angels and that they had not kept it. <sighs> Would you say that is the picture of being gentle? <laughs> it's not very gentle, is it? But was it the truth? It was the truth, but it, it wasn't gentle. Reminds me of where we're going to be in the, the adult class when Paul says, which would you prefer, the rod or a spirit of gentleness? And it was time for the rod, and that's what Stephen has for them. And he's calling them out for what they've done. But even through the whole, you're stiff-necked and uncircumcised and ears and heart, and you've rejected the law, and you've, you've murdered the just one. Notice, that's not when they pick up the stones. Oh, they're, they're plenty mad about it. They're plenty angry about it. When they heard these things, they're cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But that's not the point where they drag him out of town and stone him. They're angry. But then you have Stephen saying what he says. He, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, Look, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And that's interesting. Let me ask you a question. As you think about what Stephen said and what Stephen saw. I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Was Stephen a witness of the resurrected Jesus? 
Notice what he says. He does not say, I see the Son of God. That's not what he says. He says, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Was Stephen a witness of the resurrected Jesus? The answer is yes. Yes, he was. I think you would, I think you would have to say, Later on, when Paul's in Athens, when he gets to the point of the resurrection, what do the Athenians do? They mock him. They mock the whole idea of the resurrection. Here, as Stephen has gotten to the point of mentioning, huh, if you see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, what does that mean Jesus did? Right? He's pointing towards the fact, yeah, they had killed Jesus, but did Jesus stay dead? No, he's resurrected. I see the Son of Man. And that's when they kill him. That's when they kill him. Come over to 1 Thessalonians. That is what set them off. Well, we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And you'll understand why I want to read from this as it talks about that he slept. Stephen slept as it says, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, at verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. We just sang a song about the Lord's return a little bit ago, and that's what this verse is pointing towards, the coming of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Notice what it says, that the alive, at the time of the Lord's return, that the alive are caught up with the sleeping. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Stephen slept, right? Stephen slept. We may sleep. We may not. <laughs> we may not. Regardless, we do not sorrow as others who have no hope. That's the point of the passage. We do not sorrow as others who have no hope. So as we think about our hope, look at the end of the letter. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look over at verse 23. As we think about the hope that we have, not sorrowing as others who have no hope. This is chapter 5 at verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. As we think about the hope that we have, and as is spoken about in other places, the hope of the resurrection, we have Stephen's address. We have his address. We have Stephen's truth, as we spoke about this morning. And I would suggest we also have Stephen's hope, right? We sorrow, but not as others who have no hope. As they took Stephen and laid him to rest, do you think they were sorrowful that this faithful brother in Christ had been killed? Undoubtedly, they were sorrowful. But did they sorrow as others who had no hope? No, they had hope. Stephen had hope. And then you have Stephen's desire for them. And then the lesson is yours. What was Stephen's desire for those that he spoke to? Lord, do not charge them. Right? And there have been parallels made between what Stephen says and what Jesus said on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
Well, when were those folks forgiven that Jesus is speaking about? Forgive them for they know not what they do. We come up to Acts chapter 2. We actually have the benefit of knowing when Stephen says, Lord, do not charge them with this. Okay, well, when were they forgiven? Now we're back to Saul of Tarsus because Saul of Tarsus was there. And Saul of Tarsus, back in that account in Acts, as you think about it, there in Acts, it says, before Stephen, before he passed, calling on God says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Did Saul of Tarsus hear that? I think you would have to say he did. He is less than a stone's throw away from Stephen. They laid their cloaks, their coats, at his feet. So Saul of Tarsus would have heard that, would have heard him say that. Do not charge them with this sin. Okay, when was Saul of Tarsus forgiven? Was it in Acts chapter 7? Nope. It's when Ananias comes in and says, Why tarriest thou arise and be baptized? Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's when his sins were forgiven. That's what the account says. That's when his sins were washed away. So when Stephen says, Do not charge them, it mimics what Jesus said on the cross, and Stephen dies in hope. In hope for himself, and in hope for those who heard him. And we know Saul's going to eventually become... Paul. He's going to become a Christian, and he's going to become faithful. And hopefully you understand the application. And thinking about that, and I was thinking during Brace's prayer, talking about being sure to make an application. And we have to make the application. And with Stephen's whole address, okay, what's the application? <laughs> We're not Jews, <laughs> so what's the application for us? And I think it, we should probably just consider 1 Corinthians 10 that we're familiar with. Those first few verses in 1 Corinthians 10, it's the history once again of Israel. And then you know what it says? And these things were written for our admonition. Therefore, him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. right? And he will make the way of escape that we may bear it. We can make the same bad choices that they make. We can resist the Holy Spirit just as they resisted the Holy Spirit. We can follow the pattern or we can break the pattern. That's what we can do. We recognize the destination that Stephen was going in. right? We recognize as he was pointing towards the temple, pointing towards the resurrection, and we recognize the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. We look forward to... We look forward to heaven, frankly. We look forward to that time when we are with the Father and we are with the Son and with, we are with the Holy Spirit and we are with those who have gone on before us. That's what we are looking forward to. And therefore, as you have that destination, we know the direction that we should be going. Stephen's audience, they thought they were so much better. You don't think we can fall into the same trap? <laughs> we can fall into the exact same trap. We have, to learn, we have to learn the lesson is what we have to do. And the lesson is yours. If you're here this evening, as we think about the hope that we have and we think about what empowered Stephen to teach this lesson and we think about Stephen dying faithfully. And whether we're young or old, we simply say this. If the Lord does not return in our lifetime, do we have to do the same thing Stephen did? Do we have to die faithful? That's not rocket science. Be faithful until death. That's what we are called to do. And we will leave the invitation with you this evening. And that's the invitation. So if you're here and need to respond, either in becoming a Christian, putting on Christ in baptism, in remission for your sins, or whether it's coming back, coming back to faithfulness, and, and once again turning away from your sin, please come this evening while we stand and while we sing the invitation of the